Upper management, when they're looking on who's going to be the next creative director, it's do they have a creative vision? When they come to meetings, when they come and represent creativity, is there a vision? Is there a plan? And do they express leadership and showing where we need to go and how we're going to get there and understanding the why and the how and the, and the what? All of those things, that's what you need to do when you have vision. Welcome to Real Creative Leadership, a place where creative leaders can find insights and practical guidance on the day-to-day -day job of being a creative leader. We focus on real issues, topics, and insights of creativity in the business world. Join me as we explore the best strategies for developing your team, getting others to embrace your vision, and generating amazing experiences. This webinar series is produced by The Stoke Group. I'm your host, Adam Morgan, Adobe Executive Creative Director and author of Sorry Spot Emotions Drive Business. And this is Real Creative Leadership. So I'm really excited today to talk about what it takes to become a creative director. And in more simple terms, I'm going to talk about the nine steps it takes to become a creative director. As always, thank you for, for listening and, and please subscribe, share this with your friends. I'd love to hear a comment as we get into this topic, but I'm just so grateful for everyone who, who joins us on this podcast and, and video blog. All right, well, I'm going to start out with a story. Um, this is what I call my dark day in December. And this was years and years ago when I worked at McCann Erickson, um, it was the mid nineties. Uh, and the way it worked is, you know, back then I was a, just a, a hot writer, you know, creative. There was uh, in the agency, there were actually four of us there. Were, it was a kind of like two teams, two writers and two art directors that worked together. And it seems like everything that we did was the, you know, in the limelight for the agency, you know, all the campaigns that clients bought, all the big, um, you know, campaigns that we worked on, it was all, it always came down to us four. We were the four core creatives that were always working on things. And this is in a big agency, you know, there were, there's hundreds of employees. Um, and so I thought we were just like on top of the world. We were the four best. Um, all the work that we did was, was always, uh, always the best. And then this moment came in December where, um, we met as a creative team and I found out that the other three had all been, uh, promoted to associate creative director, except me. And it was a really, really hard day for me. Uh, I was really confused. I was like, what? We were all doing the great work, all four of us. We were all there. We were all participating. Why me? Why did I not get the promotion and everyone else got the promotion? And I'll tell you, I didn't understand until years, years later why. I mean, I can clearly see it now, but back then I was stumped. I was like, I thought I was on top of my game. I was doing the best. And here, you know, I missed out on a big promotion and everyone else got the promotion. So that was my dark day in December. And it took me years and years to figure out what was going on. And now, you know, with the blessing of hindsight, I can look back and say, oh, of course, of course, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to make the move to become a creative director. And that's the thing is a lot of us want to become a creative director. And maybe many of you who are listening to this show right now are looking to make the jump. You're ready to, to make, uh, take the leap to become a creative director. Or maybe some of you are already a creative director and you're just looking, you know, to, to double check to make sure you're doing things right. But what I want to do is I'm going to go through really what it takes to become a creative director, because I think we have some misperceptions. Just like I did on that dark day in December, we really get it wrong. In fact, let's start with this, like the internet gets it wrong. When, as I was preparing for this and just doing searches out there of like, what does it take to become a creative director? You know, what does the internet teach you? And there were many articles that were, you know, the five steps, the 14 steps, the three things it takes to be, be a CD. But I'll be honest, really what all of them were talking about, they, they said things like this, like to be a great creative director, first you have to learn the tools. You have to get really, really good at the craft. You have to, you know, find your style. You have to really understand what makes your, your style different. And then you just need to produce it and do well. And then suddenly you'll become a creative director. And that is absolutely false. That is absolutely the myth that the internet teaches us that it's all about improving on the craft. That's not it at all. Like that makes you a great senior creative, a great designer, a great writer. That's what that, those steps do. They don't make you a great leader. They don't make you a great creative director. So I think, you know, we need to you know, like get the record straight now and, and really talk about what it takes to become a creative director. And I'm not talking about a creative director, like if you own your own company or, you know, whatever, this is like, if you're at an agency or at a company and you're leading a team, what does it mean to be a creative director? Because with the world, you know, back then when I wasn't ready, 
my perception of what creative directing was is that, oh, now I get to be the CD. I get to make all the, the call the shots on which creative we're going to run with. I get to go present it. And, you know, Adobe, we did this, this fun uh, campaign a year or so ago. It was all about, you know, this creative and the, as he was designing something and the creative director just came in and hovered over his shoulder. It was called the hovering art director um, campaign. Because that's what we thought. We think, you know, when you become a creative director, what you get to do is now I get to manage a bunch of other creatives and I get to be the rock star and call the shots on what creative gets to work and what gets to be presented, right? Like that's what we thought it was. And, you know, all, I think another myth that I had back then was if I just work really, really hard at the craft and I become a rock star at the craft, then they'll make me a creative because I'll be the best in the room, right? That's how, that's how you become a creative director. And the thing that, you know, what I want to back up and talk about is you have to like, when you're making that jump to creative director, you have to completely change your perspective because everything I just explained up until now is completely wrong. And as I walk through all the things that it does, that it takes to become a CD, you're suddenly, you'll realize that those things are so low on the list and those are not the most important things. So first thing you have to understand is take the perspective of upper management or leadership, right? On all this, don't take the perspective of being a creative person. Think about what are they looking for when they're promoting someone to a creative director? What do they need? They don't need just the rockstar creative. They'll just keep you as a senior creative. If you're really, really good at the craft, why, do, why would they need you as a creative director? They need you to do your job as a rockstar senior creative, period. That's it. So number one, start with the perspective of upper management. What are they looking for? And then I would say the next step is, is to really have some, uh, you know, take a, a strong look at yourself inside and really think about what is it that you want out of this? Um, you know, it's funny. I was at a, a conference a year ago uh, before this whole COVID thing hit and it was a developer conference. And uh, at this developer conference, it was this presentation on, you know, how to become a manager. And it was so funny for me because I went in there thinking, yeah, you know, in the creative world, everyone wants Everyone wants to be the creative director. Everyone wants to be the CD. And we're all like raising our hands and saying, me, 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 let me be it. And I went to this developer conference and it was like they were just pulling teeth out of all these developers to try and convince one of them to be a manager. You know, when they said, all right, who here wants to become a manager and manage people? No hands went up in the, in the room. And the lady who was presenting was like, yeah, me too, years ago. Like there's just this perception that they just wanna just do, this, do the coding and not have to deal with people problems. Or is it the creatives like, we want to be the star, right? Such a different world. But, you know, I've had this conversation with so many people um, in agency, at Adobe, you know, everywhere I've worked. And I've sat down and talked with them about, okay, if you're ready to make the jump to CD, let's, let's look at it realistically. And by the time I talk them through all the stuff you have to do, the skills that you really need to have, the, the, what your time is going to be spent on, all the things that you're doing, it's not what you got in this business to do, right? And there are several of them that have looked at it and said, yeah, you know what? I don't want to do that. I don't want to deal with all of those other things because I love the craft. In fact, I've just been, you know, I interviewed a lot of uh, people later on in their careers for a session on, on creative careers. And there are many of them that after becoming ECD at a big company, they kind of, they're done with it. And they go back to just being a freelancer because they just want to be closer to the work. They want to be closer to creating things. I mean, that's what we love. That's what we, that's why we got into this business. So that's the, first, that's the next thing to do is like, really take a good look internally. Do you really want it? Really look at all the stuff that a creative director is doing and make sure that's the right path for you. Because let me tell you, there are other paths. This is not the only path, you know, management is just one path. Um, and that's a separate topic. We, you know, come back and listen to the session on, on creative career paths, but anyhow, so take, take a hard look at, at what you really want out of it. And then I just want to point out two insights that are really important. Number one, what makes you an amazing creative is not what makes you amaz an amazing creative director. They are two completely different things. You know, your, your skills, your talent, your dedication, your ideas, those are all great, but they're low on the list. That's the craft. The craft is not what makes you a great creative director. And then the second truth is, you know, being a rock star doesn't qualify you to be a leader. So even if you're the best at it, at your company, that doesn't qualify you, you to be a great leader. I mean, here's the truth. How many people, how many you know, creatives are reading books on leadership or taking a, a, a course on leadership or listening to podcasts on, des, on, not just on design or writing, but are you listening to podcasts on leadership? 
Now, hopefully you are today, like this is about creative leadership, so good, but really think about how you're preparing yourself for this role versus preparing yourself to be a great creative. If all the stuff you look at and read and absorb is about the craft, then you're missing a lot of the skills because all the hard skills that you have as creative, that's one thing. But when you become a creative director, there are so many soft skills and they are completely different skills. So keep that in mind. And here's the problem. In our, in, in our industry, so often we end up promoting the person who's the rock star into a leadership role and it's a failure because they don't, they're not, they'll, they are ill prepared to take on that role. They're good at making stuff, designing stuff, writing stuff, whatever it is, but they have no idea, you know, the skills, the soft skills it takes to become a manager and a creative director. So it's not about hard skills, it's about soft skills. So make sure that, you know, A, you're ready to do this, you know you want it, you're prepared, you're preparing yourself for all of these things, and then you're actually, you know, striving to be good at a completely different set of skills. All right. Enough with that. Now let's get into the list. So this is the, the, the nine things, the nine steps you need to take to become a creative director. I'm just going to go through them one by one, talk about them a little bit. And to be honest, I think these things are so important. Chances are we'll most likely do a separate show on each one of these steps, right? It's not just going to be, you know, I, I won't be able to spend a half an hour going through all of these in great depth if I do them all at once. So we're going to have to do them one at a time, but I will at least give you a flavor and talk you through the list and give you a vision as to why this is important and why, why this matters in terms of becoming a creative leader. All right, number one, at the top of the list, the thing that you need to be good at are relationships. And here's why this is hard for a lot of creative people. Think about it, as you, when you're in the flow, when you're doing your best work, when you're in the zone, chances are you're most likely alone. You're the lone wolf in the cave, you know, really, really focused on the work, doing that deep work, and you're designing, and you're writing, and you're really focused on creativity, coming up with ideas. That's what we've done our whole lives in the craft, is we've been the lone wolf. And then we come out and show the big shiny object and say, look what I've done, Whoa! you know, ta-da. And then that's like, that's the thrill of uh, the hunt of like finding the idea and then presenting the idea. But when you become a creative leader, I've seen so many people fail at creative leadership because they're so used to staying on their own and they go back to the cave and they do the lone wolf thing and they're just not ready. Like as a creative leader, you need to be out there building relationships, building trust, becoming a strategic partner, getting involved with so many other things. And you can't just wait for people to come at you. You can't just, you know, have your checklist of things to do and the project manager tosses one on your list and you just, you know, go into your cave and do your thing. You have to actively seek out and build relationships, period. Like this is not an introvert extrovert conversation. This is just saying like, if you're going to be a leader, you have to go out there and build those relationships. You have to go out and build the trust and you have to become that partner because if you no longer want to be a set of hands, this is step one is making sure you build those relationships and making sure it's, it's multiple relationships with leadership, with it, with finance, with other marketers, with other strategists, like you are going to be the representation of creativity at your company. So you have to be able to hold your own toe to toe and be able to build and grow with all of those people. And here's a good test. Here's a great test to know if you have done step one well enough. And that's that you don't have to keep asking to be added to meetings. You no longer have to ask to join a meeting. It just happens automatically. They know that when there's a meeting, we need the creative expert to come and, and weigh in on this and they'll just invite you to stuff. So that's a good rule of thumb. Step one, relationships. All right, number two, this is what we call speaking khaki. Uh, let me explain that a little bit more. So what I'm really saying is you need to learn how to speak business. You need to learn how to speak strategy. You need to learn how to speak the language of everyone else. You know, back in the day, everyone else used to wear a suit and us creatives, we wear clown suits, right? And so we used to be talking to the suits, but now it's business casual. So, I, you know, we call it talking khaki. You have to learn how to speak business. And this is so critical. There is no way you're going to build those relationships understand the business, know where to drive and give a creative vision if you don't understand what they're talking about. Again, we have a completely separate session on this. We talked with Douglas Davis about learning the language of others and how to speak business. Please dial in and, and listen to that one. But think about it, like you've trained yourself on, on aesthetics, you've trained yourself on fonts and spacing and words and story, and everyone else has trained themselves on business and numbers and finance and 
and strategy and all these other things. And if you get in the room and you want to be a leader and you can't speak that, you don't know how your company makes money, you don't know how you're going to move forward because you don't understand the business strategy. If you don't understand those things, then you're worthless. You're just, again, making things look pretty. But if you want to be a leader, you got to get past that. you got to step above that. So, you know, as you are the defender of design, you've got to be up there and understand and speak strategy and speak business in order to lead it and guide it, right? That's super, super critical. All right, step three, vision and leadership. So once you have relationships, once you understand, you know, how to speak business, now this is the hard work of the leader, right? The creative leader. This is where you have to go back and say, okay, let's look at the vision of my team. Let's look at the vision of the company. Where do we need to go? What are the things that we need to do? Where are the gaps? Where can I, you know, this is really like, think about back when you used to use creativity to come up with ideas or creativity to come up with campaigns or a good story. This is where you're going to use creativity to come up with a vision. You have to be able to think deeply about the environment, the resources, the vision of the company, and then map that to a, a creative vision of like, how can I have more emotional ex experiences? You know, if creativity is the new differentiator for business. If, if experiences are the new differentiator, how am I going to influence those? How are we going to make those better at our company? And that takes really digging in. You know, I remember, I remember when I made my first step to ECD in an agency, the way I did it is I came to the company with a plan and a vision. And it was like, you know, multiple pages with, st you know, clear steps of like, here's what we're, I'm going to do with the creative department. Here's how I'm going to handle training. Here's how I'm going to handle all of those things. Here's what our why is, our just cause, understanding where we need to go and where the destination is. And I just listed it all out because that's exactly where I needed, I wanted the, the creative team to go. And that's what they're looking for. Upper management, when they're looking on who's going to be the next creative director, it's do they have a creative vision? When they come to meetings, when they come and represent creativity, is there a vision? Is there a plan? And do they express leadership and showing where we need to go and how we're going to get there and understanding the why and the how and the, and the what? All of those things. That's what you need to do when you have a vision. So that's number three, creating a vision. Number four, presenting and selling. So one time years ago, my kids asked me what I was really good at. And I thought deeply about it. I thought, you know what? I'm really just like, I'm really good at meetings. That's what it is. Like, that's what I do. Honestly, I, I can say most of my job of being a creative leader for the last decade is I have six to eight meetings a day. And I'm talking with people, whether it's, you know, managing down with the team, managing sideways with peers, or managing up to, to the, um, the board. Like, whatever that is, that's what I'm doing. I'm in meetings. So you just have to understand, like, your job as a creative leader is to present, to sell, to present, to sell, and you have to be able to own the room. Again, you can't just back off and sit back and kind of let things happen because the reality is at the leadership table, decisions are made in those, in those rooms, in those meetings. And if you're going to be the defender of design, the champion of creativity, you have to be there and you have to be present and you have to be not aggressive, but you just need to be engaged and you need to be able to present and understand and speak their language, talk about things, and then bring it back to the vision and plan and then sell and say, here's why, and here's what we're gonna do, and here's how we're gonna make it happen. And get people excited. I mean, part of presenting and selling is really like motivating people. That's really what it comes down to. You have to, you can't be passive. You're like a salesperson. You have to get them excited. You have to motivate them and show them the vision and get them and, and get them going and all together. So you have to be the, become you know a great presenter and uh, part of meetings. All right, number five. Once you've done, that's like kind of all, the, all, everything we've talked about so far has been like all the work managing up and, and, and sideways. Now we get to the, the process of, of managing the team a little bit. And I call this managing the creative machine because really as a leader, your job is to set up the systems and the structure and the process and the environment. You have to get all of those things figured out to give an opportunity for those who are on your team, the writers, designers, the videographers, whoever they are, for them to have the space and the environment to be able to create amazing stuff, right? It's not going to happen on its own. Just in normal business, business doesn't understand creativity very well. And it doesn't create the environment and the process and, and the, the pieces for that to happen. So that's your job. You are now in charge of org and structure. Like there's so many times that I'm doing PowerPoint decks or, you know, we're figuring out how are we going to save the files on the server? How are we going to organize our fonts? How are we going to organize our files? Like there's so much that is involved with just like the nitty gritty back end of it. But then it's also like the environment. How am I going to 
defend and make sure that there's space so there's not too many meetings there's not you know so many things going on that the people can't focus on and, and do the craft right so you have to do all that stuff all of that organization um, the technology the needs the budgets the training the best practices and improvement what is your you know what are your what is what is how you create the work that's that's super important templates standards like do you have a design system do you have a, a storytelling system workshops training keeping your people excited how do i we the team like all of that that machine that's everything you have to do and create to create that environment and b- let me tell you building the machine is a lot of work it may see like oh okay i've been doing this a long time i know what the right answer is you may not know all the answers there's so much going on with it so just be ready that you need to balance all of that and be able to build the machine and be and and focus on that because that is your job is to make sure that's humming all right, number six, resourcing. So this is this is a fun one um, because so often you think, oh, that's just what the you know the project managers handle. But let me tell you, like you have to become a project manager. You have to become a traffic manager. A lot of of, of the job is still like, all right, I've got the team, but is everyone on the team busy? Are there people who aren't busy? Are we managing the workload? Are we balancing the workload? Are people doing all the right things? And do they have the the tools that they need to do it? So. Doing all of that is really, really critical. Something that I've actually come up with is what I call uh, the the Whelm scale, and there's a separate session on this. Um, but it was all, you know, in my effort to understand and balance the workload and make sure everyone's working well and doing all the right things and not overloaded. Is this Whelm scale? Because I didn't want people overwhelmed, but I didn't want them underwhelmed. So how do we get people to be perfectly whelmed? And it's different for every company. That's the tricky thing. You can't just say, oh, it, everyone should have five projects, because the truth is. Some people can take 20 projects and some people can take three before they're overwhelmed. Some people, you know, if there's too many meetings, they're not going to get other work done. If, if it's not a matter of hours, you know, timesheets, that's not the answer. If, like how many out billable hours are they working? It's really like a balance of all of these things of projects, presentations, uh, hours, you know, how busy we are with all these things. And so I created this scale to kind of harness it all together. And then you can kind of like self-select on the scale of like where you're at. Okay, I won't go too much into it, but just just know this, like part of that is how do I manage all of the workflow and how do I keep it humming and not falling off the rails, but also not be, you know, we don't want people bored or just not, not effective. Okay, next, step seven is what I call the hustle. Now, if, uh, a friend of mine also calls this, calls this rattling the cages. You know, part of being a creative leader is you can't just sit back and let things happen. Like you have to make things happen. Um, and it's passion, you know, and I've interviewed a lot of other creative leaders they just say, you know, passion will show beyond even just talent. Like you could be super talented, but if you don't have the passion, you're not going to move up. You're not going to take on that role. You're not going to be actively engaged in doing all of these things I just talked about, right? There's so much to do. You've just got to be engaged, engaged. And so the hustle is where it comes into it. Like sometimes this means more work, right? Like I, I guarantee like the, as I moved up into the creative director role, it was a lot more work than when I was just you know, a senior creative, a hundred percent, because I may still have to do all of my work and still do all those meetings and still have a vision and find time for all of it. And let me tell you, there are so many ankle biters that will attack you and you have to learn to just balance the load. Like I know I have a friend who was like, you just need to become an essentialist. And I'm, I'm not an essentialist and I don't know if I can get there, but I do believe in the, in the, the philosophy of it, right? That you need to somehow find all the right things that you need to do and then, and then get past the things you don't, but you, in order to do, get there, you just need the hustle. Like you're going to have to be just thinking and going and, you know, being five steps ahead on everything. And you're going to have to be, if you want to, you know, creativity to have a shot, you got to, you got to, you know, use that energy to get your team going, to get your company going. You got that hustle and that energy has got to just be present. And if you're out there rattling the cages and making change and, you know, making a better world, like it all starts with that inner hustle. So if you don't have it, find ways to, it's like, there's another way of thinking about it. It's like, how do you manage your energy levels? Are you eating in the right things, exercising, doing whatever it takes so that you can be on top and ready to go when it matters? That's that's critical. All right, number eight, managing other creatives. So number eight and nine are the two steps at the bottom of the list that I talked about in the beginning, which is what we all thought that's what creative directing was all about. So man, like you get to do the work and then you get to manage the team, right? And that's true. You do have to manage other creatives. And I tease that it's like empathy meets anger management because 
people think, oh, managing, I can tell everyone what to do. That's great. No, it's so much more than that. Now you got to deal with the people problems. All this other stuff was like structure and process and organization and vision and selling. But with, with uh, managing other creatives, like we are <clears throat> a wonderful emotional group of, of folks. And it takes a special breed to be able to manage uh, other creatives. So you have to learn what are all their paths? What are all their dreams and hopes? How are you going to train them? How are you going to recruit them? How are you going to mentor them? How are you going to deal with HR issues and office moves and all the other things that have to do with people problems? And that's what managing other creatives is all about. How do you do that in an emotional way and still have empathy for them and still do it in a nice, uh, kind way so that they trust you and care about you? And, and, and that you show that you care about them, right? You're not micromanaging. You're giving them freedom. You're giving them uh, a, a, autonomy and authenticity and ownership and all of those good things. Like there's just so much to think about in managing other creatives. So don't, don't kid yourself. That's, it's a big job. And, and again, remember, this is like one of nine. And it's like a full-time job right there. And then finally, let's talk about nine. Nine is the actual craft. And the reality is you need to become a working CD. You know, gone are the days where you could just kind of run things and not stay close to the craft. You still have to do it and so that you stay sharp, right? And I'm not saying that you have to take on all the projects, but you just can't, you can't ignore it and you can't forget it. If you become a creative director and you never do anything, then you're toast because you're not close enough to it, right? And you've got to be able to stay close enough to it so that you can make good decisions on what's the right creative to, to use, what's the right creative to go forward with. So... The craft is still there and teaching the craft to everyone else in your team, super, super important. But now that you have the list, let's look at the whole list here of all the nine steps from relationships, speaking khaki, vision and leadership, presenting and selling, the creative machine, resourcing, hustle, managing other creatives, and then the craft. Like that's the full list. And, you know, again, when we talked in the beginning, everyone thought, or at least I did early in my career, that being a creative director was all about numbers eight and nine. And it's not. Those are the lowest things on the list. All these other things above, that's where it comes back to that perspective. Put on the hat of upper, uh, upper management. When they're looking for a creative director, they're not looking for someone who's just good at the craft. If you're just awesome at video, you're awesome at art, like that's just one thing. And the problem is too many of us got, you know, moved up into the, in the position of CD for that and it was just a retention strategy. It's like, oh no, we don't want to lose our rock star. Okay, fine, we'll make them a creative leader. And then they fail at it and they're terrible at it. And we have a lot of, you know, prima donnas, people with, you know, egos, people who are moody and all these other problems in leadership that I think it's finally, you know, kind of come to the surface and we want to get past that. Leadership is a real different quality and you've got to focus and work on it. So all those other things, number one through seven, those are the things that a creative leader needs to be successful. You have to have all of those and you have to be working on them constantly. I fail at it all the time. That's okay. But that's just my point is like from the perspective of upper management, when they're looking for the next person to come up, it's not about the person who's just great at the craft. It's do they get these other things as well? You still have to have the craft. Don't get me wrong. You, you, you can't be like the worst creative in the world and then, and then move up. Maybe, although to be, to be truthful, I've known of a couple creative directors who were mediocre art directors or, or writers, but amazing creative directors, right? So it's a completely different set of skills. But here's a quick test. So what's a good test to know if you're ready? I would say, look at your next performance review or your last performance review. If you came into that performance review and you were talking things all about like, my work's the best at the company or the agency, or, you know, I've been a senior creative director or a senior creative forever. And it's about time I get the reward of moving up, like at this entitlement step. And you're, it's all about me, 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 and my work and how I'm doing great. That was me on that dark day of December. All I thought about was like, oh man, my work was, is always the one that the client buys. It's always the best. I was so focused on my work and my portfolio and I wasn't worried about any of those other things. So think about that. If you went into your, into your review and you're just talking about those things, you are not ready. You're talking about only step nine, right? If you're talking about your portfolio, your projects, your ego, or complaints about all the other things and the problems that people are doing, you're not ready to become a creative director. But let's say that port, that that review, your your um, performance review, is all about, hey, I've been thinking about vision, right? I've been thinking about these relationships with these stakeholders, how you know process, how we can fix these problems, how we can change our process to do this and this and that, how we can improve to get better. Like, if you come into a, a review and you're talking about all of those things, the stuff at the top of the list, then I'm going to say that person is ready. That person is ready to take on the role because they're doing it. You're thinking about all the right things. 
now let's look at that. If you look at that list, if you're managing, you know, from the bottom up, like level number nine, and number eight, and heading that direction, you're not ready. But again, if you are talking and thinking about all the things from relationships, talking khaki, like business problems, all that from the top down, chances are you're, you're, you're ready and on the path. So last thing, keep that in mind. I promise you the moment you start taking on the mantle of the company and not the mantle of your own personal portfolio, you will see the gaps. You will see like, oh, I see the skills that I'm missing. I need to get better at you know presenting. I need to get better at vision. I need to get better at leadership. And I need to go back and start reading books and taking classes and being better at those things, the soft skills. That's when it'll start to change for you. And then you'll look back and you'll be like, I'm already there. I'm already ready. Because here's your more moment of truth, right? So many times people think it's the creative director that's holding them back. Or upper management doesn't see their, their skills and they're not making the, the creative director and they don't get it. But the truth is, who's really holding you back? It's probably you. Just like me on that dark day in December, I was holding myself back because I was focused on the wrong things. I wasn't showing leadership. I wasn't showing vision. I wasn't showing anything. I was thinking about me and my portfolio. So when you become a creative director or creative leader, it's, it's yourself. Like you can look back and you can assess this list and say, am I doing well at all of these things? And I guarantee if you're doing it already, you'll be ready. You'll, you'll be ready to make this, the leap. And if, and if you're already in a creative position or a creative leadership position, I hope you're doing all of those things because that's how you're gonna get better. That's where we need to be as creative leaders is getting better at all of those things and improving the environment and the opportunity for all the cre for creativity to have a chance to live, right? That's where it's all about. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you got something from, you know, at least looking at the list, thinking about you, your own personal experience, where are your own personal gaps, what can you do better, and, and then really digging in deep and trying to make those things happen. I think it's it's super awesome. But anyhow, thank you for listening. That was, you know, my nine steps to becoming a creative director and the important things it takes to become a creative leader. I hope you found it valuable. Uh, again, thank you so much for, for joining us. This is Real Creative Leadership. You can find this on all of your favorite podcasts or streaming channels. Please, please subscribe. Uh, if this content is really helpful, I would love to have your feedback. So please share, share comments, share it with your friends, come back and subscribe. That's the big ask to make sure you know we start to build this community. Uh, if you have a question or you just want the latest news on Real Creative Leadership, please go to realcreativeleadership.com. Drop us a line. Uh, and in fact, here's one last thing, one last, uh, I guess we'll call it a, a homework. For those of you listening, if you go to realcreativeleadership.com and check out the show notes for this session, we're going to put a, a PDF, a well-designed PDF with the nine steps. And all I'm asking is just go download that list so that you can print it out, put it on your desktop, whatever you need to do, and just put that up to be thinking about it all the time. Like, what are those different things and am I doing all of that? So that's the ask. Join us. Come subscribe. Um, join us uh, on the list, but go download in the next 72 hours. Go download that list off of uh, realcreativeleadership.com and then make it so put it somewhere visible so you can just be thinking about it. Again, you can find us on YouTube. You can watch it on YouTube, uh, the video versions of this. Um, check us out on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. Uh, you can find the Stoke Group at thestokegroup.com. Again, this is produced by the Stoke Group. Super grateful for them. We wouldn't have it if it wasn't for them. So if you need help with any of these things as a creative leader, they're, they're the agency that can help you. And if you want to connect with me, you can go to adamwmorgan.com. You can see where I'm speaking next, uh, information about my book or articles that I'm writing. But as always, the best place is realcreativeleadership.com. Thank you so much, and we will see you next next uh, next show. Take care. Thanks for listening to Real Creative Leadership. I'm your host, Adam Morgan, and this series was brought to you by The Stoke Group. For the most effective marketing, use both sides of your brain to align your strategy, creative, execution, and analysis. Connect with The Stoke Group for help designing each step of your marketing plan and creating a coherent vision. Visit thestokegroup.com to learn more.